the Cranky Geek Fall 2021 show is possible thanks to our sponsors, Google, Agora, Daily, Dolby I.O., Element, Intel, and Ring Central. See the links in the description for more information. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my session on large WebRTC grids with a focus on managing the compute power of the device where the browser is running. So large grids have been growing in demand in recent years for applications such as uh, fan walls and uh, home training, where the instructor or teacher doesn't want to have to be paging through um, people when they want to see the whole class, especially if they're an exercise instructor. It's not very convenient. So as you can see here in the slide, this is an eight by eight grid running perfectly fine on my MacBook Pro. The remote users here are, are all joining from headless Chrome, um, looping audio and video files as fake camera and microphone input devices. The, the device that I connect with is a, is a real device in each case. Um, so this is a perfect real world test. And this setup allows me to easily emulate any network conditions and find the hardware limits of, of any real device. So what's needed to operate large grids? You'll need a server-side infrastructure that can support delivering many streams to many people. And this is something I talked about at the last Cranky Geek when demonstrating Agora's network architecture. Then on the client side, the device is going to need to have both a good network connection and good compute power. When the device doesn't have these things, steps need to be taken really quickly to adjust the experience to suit the device or the experience for the user will quickly become awful. Frozen video, choppy audio, I'm sure you've seen all that stuff before. So as far as network adaptation goes, adapting to poor networks, much work's been done in this area over the years. Um, recent developments around transport-wide congestion control, send aside bandwidth estimation, um, which means that where network resources are limited, the total bit rate sent down to the client is kept just below what it's able to handle. Compute adaptation, on the other hand, is another story altogether. So compute power is needed for both the encoding of your local camera and also for decoding and rendering each of the remote streams coming from other users in the conference. Depending on the hardware of your device, this compute power comes from a mixture of CPU and GPU. But when it comes to adapting to its limits, there's always been a huge piece of the puzzle that's been missing. And the problem is that CPU and GPU availability is not visible to JavaScript in the web browser for privacy reasons. Um, it's impossible to find out what exact machine hardware the person's running on. I've never completely understood this, to be honest, and I can't see why there couldn't be JavaScript events to let you know when, when uh, resources are running low, but that's just how it is, and this problem oops, has always been there. Therefore, people that are developing web pages, developers, have no idea how many remote streams the device can support before it will start freezing. So what does WebRTC itself do to try and help here? Because, because it has its own internal engine running inside the browser itself in the actual code of the browser, what's it doing? Actually, it's focusing mainly on the compute power used by the encoder and measures the encode time each frame takes and adjusts the encoding resolution and frame rate to keep the usage at a comfortable level. Now, this is good for um, if, if processes fire up in the background, it's process agnostic, and it will it'll also work on any, on any system, whether it's using CPU or GPU. The problem is, though, that this doesn't stop the browser grinding to a halt if there are many decoders running because there's many people in the conference. Remote videos will stop running um, as CPU or GPU limits start to get approached. So here's my back to my lab, and this is what I call my heads up display. Hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, these three videos with writing with the yellow uh, text over the top, these are remote streams and they're being decoded. And I think it's really good to work like this, having all the stats that you need in front of you, rather than having to look at log files or switching tabs to WebRTC internals, any of that stuff. You wanna be able to see the data if you're working on this type of project. 
Um, so just quickly going down the list, we've got the resolution that's being received for this remote stream, the bit rate, the frame rate, the, the render volatility, which I'm going to talk a bit more about in a second, the decode time, the NAC rate, which is really useful for detecting when your browser is having network trouble, and the duration of the stream. And then along the top here, I've got stats which apply to the whole, um, to all of the, to the whole session, to the whole call. So there's the total inbound bit rate, which is just nice to see, but not that useful for um, detecting CPU problems. And then here I've got something called that I call stats scheduling, um, which is I set to 500 milliseconds. So when I've read the WebRTC internal stats, I ask the browser to call my function again in 500 milliseconds. And in a real time system, it should be pretty much there about 500. But as the system starts to have CPU issues, you'll find that that, um, that number can go up and fluctuate. Oops. The second number here is how long it actually takes to obtain those WebRTC stats from the engine. And this is usually quite a small time. I mean, it goes up proportionally to the number of people in the conference, remote people, but we'll find that this number sort of drops off a cliff a little bit as the uh, GPU um, resources become limited. So this is a really good indicator on, on machines which are using GPU for decoding and um, that things are starting to go wrong. Um, here we've got the average encode time across all of the streams the encode time for my own webcam. But because the internal WebRTC engine is, is adjusting the encoder to keep this fairly constant, it's not that, not that useful to a developer, although it does go up sometimes and, and is worth keeping a note on. <clears throat> and then there's this concept of a render, a render rate volatility, which is something that I sort of, you know, would like to take credit for, for discovering how important this is on some particularly CPU bound devices. Now, what this is all about is um, usually you'll be receiving from each person a fairly fixed frame rate. It might not be exactly what you set it due to the device's limitations or the lighting that it's running in, but it'll usually be sending a fairly constant frame rate. But if me as the receiver is starting to struggle with decoding, I won't be processing those frames nice and smoothly. So there's a volatility. Um, it, it moves about in terms of what the actual frame rate being received in. And this works really well on iPads, for example, for detecting that they're, they're getting to the limit of what they can handle. So I'm going to take you through now some, um, oops. OK, so just quickly look at the how we calculate some of these stats. These are the WebRTC internal statistics. And the ones that I'm particularly using are the frames per second, packets received, and total decode time. Here's the sort of the formula for the render rate volatility that I was talking about. So on a system which is starting to struggle a bit, I keep the eight last samples and I sample every 500 milliseconds. So I've got four seconds worth of data on a sort of a rolling um, list and popping one off the front and putting on the back. So the average frame rate that I'm receiving from this user is 24 frames per second, but I'm processing, that, processing them with a sort of a volatility of that of around 10%, which is starting to show that there's problems on that device. And then the scheduling and duration that I spoke about, um, the time it takes to obtain the WebRTC stats, that's an important time. And then when I schedule a callback to this particular JavaScript function in 500 milliseconds, if it's taking much longer than 500, then again, there's, there's a problem. And we have to pay attention to all these stats because different operating systems, browsers, devices, they start to um, creak in different ways. And the strategy is that when you start to notice problems, you need to reduce the resolution that you're receiving of some of the less important streams or actually stop subscribing to their video altogether. And we consider a less important stream of someone that hasn't spoken for a long time. People that are con currently contributing to the conversation, um, the active speaker is the most important, going sort of down the list there. So here we've got 16 people that I'm receiving, and you'll notice that the resolution has dropped to 320 by 180 for each of the people that I'm receiving. There's no point receiving pixels that you're not displaying. That's a complete waste of bandwidth and um, compute resources. So a good strategy anyway is to be reducing the resolution of the streams that you're subscribing to as more people join the conference. And here we've gone down again to 160, 160 by 90. So the total overall resolution that I'm decoding is, is still 720p, and I've got lots of little decoders running in parallel. And this isn't causing my, my Mac here any problems whatsoever. It, it loves it. If the user um, was to click on a particular window, um, then again, we subscribe to a higher quality stream, and this can happen automatically in active speaker mode or manually um, if the person wants to look at a particular person. And this map will go up to seven by seven, eight by eight, no problems at all. 
the way that I can actually start to introduce problems is by adding this little um, parameter on the end of the URL to force it to subscribe to higher streams than it than it than it needs to. So this is 640 by 360 again. And you'll see here that this second number here has jumped up from 90 milliseconds to read every all the statistics up to um, one, two, five, two milliseconds. Obviously, we wouldn't let it get this far in reality. We would we would stop subscribing to more streams if the dice was starting to creak in, in that manner. So now I'll quickly show you the Android Galaxy A7 has no problem with these um, these three remote streams. But when I add in these extra ones, force it up the um, the the time to obtain the stats and also the time to schedule my callback have both gone um, pretty high, including the render rate volatility. So this this is where you'd start to see the video windows going quick and slow and you know the device cannot handle it yeah. and we we can be ahead of the game with this before the users notice any problems we can make sure that we're adapting to the compute in real time um here we've got an hp pavilion this is where everything's fine no problems at all um forced it onto the high onto the high streams and the render rate volatility has started to creak first here the other numbers being fine um but again, this can yeah this this in this um, particular shot, this number started to creak as well. So you have to keep an eye on all of these numbers in order to be able to adapt um, correctly across all yeah. the. Do, do you have a specific render rate uh, volatility like percentage you're looking for to stay under? Yeah, under well, under four, under four percent is good. But I think um, up to eight percent can be reasonable. <clears throat> okay, thanks. So iPhone 12 Pro, a lot of people, when they're writing code, they'll they'll basically make decisions based on if it's mobile or desktop. But this thing's really powerful. It can it can handle um, <clears throat> almost as much as my Mac, surprisingly. Um, so here it's it's not having any trouble. Um, but with I've forced um, the streams here to be the resolution to be high just to get it to start to creak and the the time to access the stats because it's pretty much coming from the GPU. Um, went off the cliff that I mentioned and it, it took way too long to actually re read those stats back. Obviously you, you want to be ramping up the streams sort of, you know, in a manner where you don't, you don't have spikes or suddenly put the device yeah. into trouble. You'd be ramping up and keeping an eye on that number to make sure that it doesn't, doesn't go over um, an acceptable amount. And iPad mini four, this is quite a, a poor device. Um, it can just about handle these three streams, similar to the Android that I showed you, um, stick in the extra ones. And the first, well, this creaks here, the, the render rate volatility up to 19%. And the, the scheduling time went up from 500 milliseconds to, to 686. And that's the results from my lab. So a quick summary here. Modern devices can easily process multiple remote streams in parallel using hardware acceleration. Old CPU bound devices such as the iPad mini there quickly struggle. It's not a case of desktop versus mobile um, as I've shown here, but it's very much software versus hardware. In all cases, it's possible to detect resources running out programmatically before things get noticeable to the eye and um, ear. How many minutes have I got left? Am I am I doing good? Oh, yes. have I got you're fine. Cool. Um, and this is my last slide, actually. So other considerations that have to be taken into account when running large grids, you want to try and get the camera on as early as possible um, so that you don't have that big spike. If you're subscribed to like 30, 40 remote streams and you switch your camera on there, that's going to take a big CPU hit. So you need to be prepared for that. Don't blindly just subscribe to all the remote streams. You want to be ramping up and down smoothly based on the statistics that I've been showing you here today. Um, avoid subscribing to more pixels than are being displayed. So try and get try and be able to match the resolutions through simulcast or whatever you, you need to be, or having the actual high level profile of the, of the publisher being dropped down as well, depending on the device, if it supports multiple streams, et cetera to be able to try and keep the number of pixels on screen equal to what you're actually um, publishing and subscribing. Beware of tabs as well. If you put a tab into a background, 
it can send all the stats kind of through the roof because the browser gives less CPU time to, to tabs that aren't in the foreground. And lastly, audio, um, limit the number of audio subscriptions. You wouldn't want to have an audio subscription for everyone in the room. I mean, I think a sensible number of maximum is six and you can, you can decide those six based on speaker detection. Um, just a sort of an interesting fact to finish off with. I noticed um, in my sort of career in this, that the more people you have in a conference, the fewer number of people have their microphone open. So if you've got a conference of four or five people, they might all have their microphone open. If you've got up to a million people, well, that's a massive number, but you'll probably only have one person open because everyone's too scared to be heard and, and treats the thing much more seriously. So it's not usually a problem, an issue with, with audio. And that, that's it from me. Um, I'd be great if you got in touch and would want to build um, a large grid. Um, a few little facts there about Agora, um, supporting up to a million participants in a conference, global low latency, 10,000 free minutes a month. I'd love to hear hear from you and, and build something cool. Thank you. Cranky Geeks Fall 2021 Weber C event as possible. Thanks to our sponsors. Agora, the real-time engagement platform. Google and WeberC.org supporting web real-time communications. Daily, build communications into any application. Dolby I.O., the API of sight and sound. Element, use the matrix open protocol to support real-time collaboration. Intel, offering a scalable open source media server. And Ring Central, revolutionize your communications with the Ring Central APIs.